Hello and welcome to the fourth program in our five-part series of Consciousness Central 2018, coming from the Science of Consciousness conference here in Tucson, Arizona. I'm your host, Nick Day, and in today's show, we talk with world-renowned philosopher and originator of the hard problem, David Chalmers, about a whole new problem that we didn't even know we had until now. We also talk to roboticist and neuroscientist Paul Vachure about his research into AI, plus our usual roundup of the plenary talks with conference founder and director Stuart Hameroff. As always, a packed programme on today's Consciousness Central. Well, it is my great pleasure to welcome back to Consciousness Central our dear friend and uh, maestro of philosophy in the field of consciousness studies, David Chalmers. Welcome, Dave. Oh, pleasure to be here, as always. Thank you so much for coming back. Uh, so, um, well, this year's conference was a little light on the philosophy, but uh, I think it's fair to say that when you gave your presentation, you perhaps corrected some of the imbalance. Uh, as always, your uh, presentations are very intriguing and compelling. Uh, this year, you introduced something which I think I haven't heard before, which is the, not just the hard problem of consciousness, but uh, something you're calling the meta problem of consciousness. So can you uh, elaborate on that a little bit? What is the meta problem of consciousness? Yeah, well, the meta problem is, it's a problem about a problem. You know, I mean, metacognition is cognition about cognition, and meta theory is a theory about a theory. So a meta problem is a problem about a problem. And in particular, it's a problem about the hard problem of consciousness. And roughly the way I think about it is the meta problem is why do we think there's a hard problem of consciousness? Because the hard problem of consciousness is the problem how do physical processes in the brain give you conscious experiences, subjective experiences. This contrast with the easy problems of consciousness, which is how do we produce particular behaviors like walking and talking and whatever. But there's one bit of behavior that's very closely related to the hard problem. And that's the fact that we go around saying that we're conscious. We go around saying there seems to be a problem of consciousness. We go around saying consciousness is very hard to understand. That's a bit of behavior that, uh, that I engage in. Strictly speaking, explaining that kind of behavior is one of the easy problems, but it's one that's very close to the hard problem. So that's the meta problem. Explain why we go around saying there's a hard problem of consciousness. The thought is that ought to, maybe that's a little bit more tractable than the hard problem itself, because this is all still in the level of objective science and objective behavior. But if we come up with the right explanation for that, which we don't really have yet, come up with the right explanation for that, I think it may well hold certain keys to the hard problem itself. Right, okay, so um, what comes to mind perhaps is a, a sense that we might end up in some kind of um, Recursive or infinite regress. Ah, to solve the meta problem. Well, let me see the meta we have problem. To solve the meta mean? meta problem and <laughs> so on. Yeah. Right. First, okay. We'll, we'll kick it all the way up to the twentieth level meta problem, which will be so easy we can solve it, and then kick yeah. it all the way back down. It's like the, the, who, yeah. how many turtles carry the earth? Though they they go all the way down. Yeah. So, um, okay. So, have you? What would you say? Uh, you know, what what comes out of this? What sort of where does it take us to consider the meta problem? Well, it can go in a number of different. Directions. I think it, thinking about these issues takes some people in the direction of what's sometimes called illusionism. The idea that consciousness is not real, it's an illusion. And basically, there's a, so we have a model of ourselves, an introspective model inside our head that makes us think we have these special spooky properties of consciousness that aren't real. Uh, for some reason, evolution just put in this misleading model into our head in the same way it might build simple models of the environment, and we're very much in the grip of that model, but it's all an illusion. If you took that line, then you basically think once you solve the meta problem, explain why we say all these things, then you've dissolved the hard problem. You've kind of explained consciousness away. You've just explained why we're so puzzled about consciousness. Now, I, for various reasons, I'm not satisfied by that. I think consciousness is real, it's a datum, I don't just need to, we don't just need to explain the things we say about consciousness, we need to explain consciousness itself. Mind you, the illusionist has a pretty good reply here. They can come back and say, my model, once spelled out, actually explains why you will think consciousness is a datum. 
That's just a product of your misleading self-model. And all of us are gripped. We're caught up by these self-models that run our lives, and we can't escape them. So it's an inescapable illusion. Actually, I get so enthusiastic about this view sometimes, even though I don't believe it, that I've thought about writing a book called The Inescapable Illusion of Consciousness, just to really develop the view. Okay. The end of the day, I can't believe it, but then the view does predict that I can't believe it. Do you ever consider, I think, uh, what Ramachandran was saying last year, talk, he was talking about the vantage point. He called it the vantage point problem, which I suppose would translate as, well, why me here and now? Why me? Why here? Why now? Why you? Why here? Now? Why now? As we understand it, we are beings, entities in a universe that momentarily blink in to having awareness and then we blink mm -hmm. out. But there is this sort of question, well, wow, how come we are where we are? Uh, is that something so impenetrable, or yeah. can we ever get there? No, I, I've been bugged by this for a long time. I just look in the mirror and say, there's that guy, David Chalmers, again. Why does he follow me around everywhere? Why am I always stuck inside him? Why can't I be somewhere else for a moment? You know, like Nick Day or, you know, Donald Trump or whatever. Why? How did I turn out to be right, right here? And you know, think about this enough, and you can be led to, like, solipsism, maybe... That's actually, maybe I'm a, the only conscious being in the universe, so I, so I had to be here, or other views, like maybe I'm actually hopping around all of these beings, and this is just where I happen to be right now. Um, yeah, it also goes along with the idea, was I actually conscious at all those previous moments in my history, or is this just the only, the only moment of consciousness in the whole history of the universe? Mm. You know, one could never... Uh, completely rule out these ideas. My colleague, Tom Nagel, wrote a book called The View From Nowhere, where he got very puzzled about this problem. Why am I TN, as he put it, Tom Nagel? And from an objective point of view, it makes no sense. But from the subjective point of view, it's my reality. Mm, yeah, the ontological nature of the now. Yeah. What is the now? And, and why is it now? That's the idea. Why, <laughs> why am I me? And why is it now? Why is it 2018 right now? Why is it... Um, April, whatever, 2018, of all the possible times in the universe, it could be. Is that one somehow special? Is it the only one that truly exists? Or it's just there's a whole bunch of conscious instants of being scattered throughout the whole universe. And I had to be one of them. Right, right now, I'm, this is just the one. This is it. Right now. Somehow it's all happening. Yeah. And here we are talking about it. Yeah. Amazing, this universe did some incredible tricks to get yeah. us here. David, this is a ongoing, wonderful, delightful inquiry into the true nature of things and uh, consciousness itself. Thank you so much for coming back and talking to us again. And we'll see you hopefully next time on Consciousness Central. David Chalmers, thank Thanks. you, man. It was a pleasure. All the best. <laughs> <laughs>three delightful human beings who've come all the way from Scandinavia and I know Finland is not Scandinavia I do know that much um, Scandinavia and Finland the Nordics are here and uh, so I'm with Sylvia and Sylvia here's your poster it's called matter energy and information interactions in a healthy body creating feedback loops within a vacuum tell me about your poster in about one minute or less for our research we needed to work with something called physiological consciousness which is a part of consciousness which deals with the body being um, an entity which has a consciousness in itself interacting with the environment more or less without using senses uh, which we have seen in the other workshops and uh, we have been studying a lot of uh, scientific work uh, uh, with uh, c related to vacuum qualities and also matter dialogue with energy and information and all these we have made a synthesis and this synthesis is this perspective on psych physiological consciousness so this is uh, uh, a way to uh, uh, be able to build a model for uh, uh, for alternative medicine for example well we really want to show with this model that that people can and should um, have they have power over their own health so uh, 
as I in my work, I, I meet people who kind of have lost the connection to their body or they have the feeling of it. And by this, this way of, of showing it from biochemistry and physiology and uh, information trans transfer between the vacuum and the body and back, we want to make it kind of clear that you can and you should. Okay, so very quickly tell me in some sort of real real world practical way that, that you, we achieve this uh, equilibrium in the body. Yes, well uh, if we want to have more um, more, equi more equilibrium, more energy, then one way is to, to seek stillness. Because stillness. Stillness. Because when we are in stillness, it's easier for us to connect with the information in the vacuum and get get uh, more energy. And and from that, the the body kind of heals itself in a way. Right. So just very quickly, can you define for us when you say vacuum? What are you talking about? I'm talking about uh, the energy that's all around us. The energy that's all around us. So a vacuum, to my understanding, a vacuum is a, is the absence of anything. But this vacuum has something. It has. Yeah, it's, it's got uh, everything. Uh, okay, the vacuum has everything. Okay, are you? And we're all connected and in right. entangled. Is this is, is this the vacuum that would be described by Nassim Haramein? Yes. 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 For example, him. Yes. Yes. Okay. So it has. You have his papers over here, <laughs> so you can also, if you come here, you can also read the paper, uh, the reference from his papers. Yeah. Okay, okay. And, and we're, the, the, Sylvia and uh, Elizabeth are meeting up with his uh, laboratory next week, so. Okay, so you're off to Hawaii? No. Or Maui, is it? Outside. Uh, Outside, okay. All right, well, thank you very much. And lastly, um, if somebody wants to see more about the work you're doing, is there a website or somewhere they can go to? Uh, not yet. Okay. Not yet. Not, not yet. They should just Google you and someday you'll appear, yes. Thank you very much for sharing your poster with us. That's wonderful. Thank you. And good luck with it. Uh, I'd very much like to welcome to Consciousness Central. Um, okay, this is Paul. Paul is from Holland, the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. uh, and his uh, second name, his last name, uh, I'm afraid I cannot pronounce. So I'm going to ask you, Paul, to introduce yourself. So I'm, I'm Paul Verschuren, it, it, indeed Dutch, but I, I'm living outside of Holland for a long time, so it has been bastardized in many different forms. In the, in the English-speaking world, it's more for sure, something like this. In Spain, it's more where I live right now, it's more Verschuren. So, uh, but I, I respond to many different uh, variations of my last name, it's not a problem. So my, I started life as a, as a psychologist, um, then I, I escaped from psychology in some sense, um, and moved into AI because what I was seeking was theory, really uh, psychology lacked theory. So psychology has imploded in the 50s when, when Clark Hull formulated the last really system level theory of psychology, which then collapsed under its own weight. And since then, the psychologists have been chasing details with a lot of insistence on, on let's say, their methodologies and their statistics, and it's all excellent work, but they lack theory. That's what I was looking for. And I said, okay, let's go to AI, maybe we can find some theory there. Um, but then what I discovered in AI is that decisions are almost arbitrary, right? So, so we, as, as you look at deep learning right now, people make arbitrary decisions just to get stuff to work. And they don't care about really other principles. And so that was also a bit frustrating. So um, at the time, however, that was sort of the beginnings of this sort of AI revolution, the, the embodied AI revolution. So I, I started to bring AI together with, with robotics. Um, and bring in a, a sufficient dose of psychology with respect to behavior. But then I felt, look, we have to find some grounding here in, in science, in, in neuroscience. So then I jumped over into, into neuroscience. I worked for a while with Jerry Edelman in, in, in San Diego at the Neurosciences Institute. And after that, I moved to the Salk Institute where I worked with Terry Shinovsky. Uh, and then I moved back to Europe again and basically trying to build some sort of amalgamation of these different disciplines, but in really trying to understand mind from the perspective of an embodied physical system like the brain. So this is really what the work is all about, uh, and that's also what I've been presenting here. When we talk about consciousness, obviously there are, consciousness is rather like a sort of restrictive term for something that is, um, you know, seems to have sort of multiple dimensions. It's rather mm -hmm. like the Inuit having all these names for snow. Mm -hmm. Instead, we've got one word which we try to sort of multi, you know, we have multiple purpose for. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
So what I'm going to try and dig into here is this, um, you know, this idea that uh, something wakes up, that you and I, I mean, mm -hmm. we're awake, we are aware, we're sort of, how you might say, online, mm -hmm. we're online. And uh, before you were born, before I was born, nothing, and somehow some biological process uh, uh, gives us this amazing ability mm -hmm. to sit here and talk about the very thing we're talking about, you know, the self-awareness and mm -hmm. this ability to have inquiry into the nature of this. And so th this sort of does beg the deeper inquiry with mm -hmm. AI, at what point does calculation become sentience? Mm -hmm. And can it happen? Mm -hmm. And uh, is sentience essentially only calculation? Mm -hmm. uh, so I hear what you're saying about let's explore with AI, let's explore with robots, but how will we ever know? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that would be an interesting well, look, there, there are two issues here. We already have limitations in knowing it from each other, right? So we have to acknowledge that. However, that, that's not necessarily an, 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 in, in, uh, an obstacle we cannot overcome. So, um, for in the case of the robot, I see that, and this is actually one of our bigger pro projects in the lab, is exactly targeting this question, right? So how can we build a sentient machine and how can we make that testable? So there I'm uh, following a route that basically says, well, consciousness is a, is a, is a product of evolution. It, is, it results from, from a brain. So therefore I have to understand the principles of brain organization and these principles of brain organization I can simulate or emulate in an artificial system. So for instance, in, in the, then we have to commit ourselves to definitions and, and, and hypotheses on function. And this is already, I think, where I start to diverge from most people in the field who would shy away from coming up with definitions. They would say, well, um, it's an epiphenomenon or it is everywhere, you know. So that, in that sense, you discharge yourself from definition and what you gain is that you are beyond falsifiability. So you can never be wrong, right? That's not the game of science, okay? That, that's the game of speculation, and that's, okay, I know you can get tenure that way, but I don't think it helps. We, 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 we must commit ourselves to testability. So in, in my case, I, I just see a fundamental problem that consciousness really can solve. So what are the things we can sort of agree to? If you also, if you look at the literature, right? There's a point of view. There's, there's, it is something to be like that system. So there's a point of view to it. There's a subjectivity to it. And that it also is a, this, this continuous flow of, of states, of, of these subjective states that can persist in some way. And I can even dream about seeing white elephants dancing on the mountaintops there, even when they're not there. So I can, I can decouple those states, right? Then you, you can also say, okay, what, what kind of function could that have, this point of view, this subjectivity? This, if you want, virtualization of the world. Because in the world, I see white elephants, but physically, they're not there. So how, how can I virtualize it? Well, when do you need that? Well, if you now go back to the robot domain, this automatically, when you are in the robot domain, so now I switch caps, um, you focus on issues like control. I have to control this darn thing. As you saw with Sophia here being in the room, um, this has to be controlled. It's a device that must be controlled. And what you see there, and this is consistent for both robots and for brains, to survive in real time, what brains have, have started to do, and control engineers are doing the same thing, you start to rely more and more on prediction. Right? By, by predicting the world, I can anticipate, and in that way I can survive in real time. But the problem now is, already when I start to predict, I start to virtualize, because it means I'm reacting now not on how the world is, I'm reacting to how I believe the world is. So this is one step of virtualization. So we're getting closer to a point of view. But that's not everything. The thing is that in order, I'm talking to you, we're, we're, I'm looking at you, I'm having facial expressions, I have prosody, I, I move my hands, I see cars driving on the road. See, lots of stuff is going on in parallel here. And one of the most important things I'm doing in parallel, I'm trying to gauge roughly your response to what I'm telling you. Right? If you would suddenly fall off your chair crying, this would be sort of not very successful end to this interview. So I'm trying to gauge your level of interest, but 
you are not necessarily transparent in that way as any other human in the room, right? So I have to make an inference. I have to have hypothesis about you. So what I'm saying is just for physical control, I'll have to virtualize. But as soon as other agents come in, you have to change this virtualization again with an order of magnitude because now I have to run whole models of that other agent and all these other agents in the room, right? So now I get an incredible scale enlargement of the virtualization of the world. And this leads now to a new problem and that's where consciousness comes in as far as I'm concerned. I have all these parallel models because I model, I track every agent in the room. I track other things happening in the world. I'm controlling my actions. I'm controlling my speech, all based on predictions that run in parallel. So how do you now keep that system organized and optimized? And you only can do that, and this is from a control pers engineering perspective, by then collapsing that whole parallel system into a singular representation. So now I have a virtualization of my own states that in themselves are virtualizing the world. Okay, now we are at a level of a point of view that is singular and continuous and fully virtual. It's subjective, right? So consciousness is performing that role. This is why it is subjective, that's why it has a point of view. And what does it do? Why is it there? It is there to extract norms that allow me to optimize all these parallel processors, right? So for instance, if you, if you give an interview, it, it's also important to try not to speak too loud because it changes the pitch of your voice often in an annoying way. Right? So these are the kinds of things you learn with time. But there's not a direct reward function in the world that tells me that. A, a professional journalist might tell me that afterwards, like, well, maybe you should keep your, your voice low. And now, now I've acquired a new norm. And that new norm I can now apply via this sequentialized, virtualized memory system to the parallel controller that was actually controlling my prosody. Okay, so this is now the function of consciousness, and that's also how we can make it uh, measurable and explicit. And it's with that set of hypotheses that we then went back to the brain and see, okay, does it make sense? So first we, we test this on robots in the context of social interaction. So can I build an autonomous humanoid robot like uh, Sophia that can autonomously maintain a continuous interaction with the human being that is interesting enough for the human being to actually commit to it? And the one of the examples I showed there was this replication of the Milgram obedience experiment, right? Where, where humans have a continuous interaction with the robot. And in, on top of that, they're asked to punish the robot. So we can actually measure uh, how the social cues the robot is emitting control this sense of projection and empathy that the human is generating. So this is a whole domain of, of like experimentation. And then we go to the brain and say, okay, where, where is this virtualization memory? Where does it reside? And then with that, you can unpack the brain of, of let's say, a patient that has, has electrodes in, in their brain because we try to identify where the location is of their, their epileptic seizures. But in parallel, we could, of course, do experiments with them and see where is virtualization memory. And one thing I was presenting here, well, virtualization memory is, as far as our data is showing, in very distinct memory systems in the human brain. So this is how, how the whole story then comes together. You start from a hypothesis, assumptions about function that can all be wrong, but then you make it testable. Thank you very much, Paul. With that, we'll call it a day. Okay. Uh, I really enjoyed this, and mm -hmm. uh, we'll see you next time, uh, hopefully in Interlaken. All right, we hope let's so. hope so. Bye. What's your name, sir? Victor. Victor, and uh, Victor, is this uh, this is not your first time at TSC, right? This is my third time at this conference. Yeah. Third time at the conference. So what's your interest in the science of consciousness? Uh, basically the transdisciplinary approach to consciousness. You know, you have authors and scientists of all different types and flavors, and uh, how pretty much everybody comes together to kind of try to answer what consciousness is and how it manifests itself. But uh, I'm really interested into the neuroscience and the neurophysiology, um, altered states of consciousness and things alike. What's your name? William Reed. Uh, so what is it that brings you here? What's your, uh, what's your desire when you come here? Um, the unknown answers of consciousness and this is the place to be. This is where a lot of the movers and shakers and thinkers are and I'm having conversations with everybody. It's just amazing, it's an entire week mind-blowing. I look forward to this. Uh, it, it's amazing.
And now we're back with Stuart Hammeroff talking about plenaries on Friday. Stuart. The first session Friday morning was Physics and Consciousness 2, the second physics session. The first speaker was Anurban Bandyapadye from the uh, National Institute of Material Sciences in Scuba, Japan. Anurban's uh, been to the conference uh, numerous times. He's a good friend of mine, and he's really doing cutting-edge work. He's famous for, among other things, uh, developing the first real molecular computer, and then he got into microtubule research and measured uh, quantum resonances in microtubules. His latest ideas have to do with uh, clocks within clocks within clocks within clocks, as he would say, or fractal frequencies. He thinks living systems and maybe the universe as a whole are, uh, are um, as I said, frequency, uh, fractal frequencies at the very bottom, very, very fast, and with patterns that repeat it at scales moving up and up and up and up. And as you go up, you get slower and larger uh, up to our scale. And he used these block sphere diagrams to represent uh, uh, these time, time crystals that he called them. And uh, he thinks microtubules and other uh, proteins may be time crystals. So a very kind of basic, uh, profound, deep uh, idea, uh, a train of ideas coming from Anurban once again. Very, very interesting. The second speaker was George Ellis, a, a very well-known physicist from South Africa who uh, spoke about causality. I mean, uh, how do you, I mean, how do you get causality in the universe if everything's kind of programmed and following algorithmic laws and so forth? And how do we decide to do things or how do we actually do things, move our arm or exert some effect in the world? Is it top down? Is there some consciousness moving down or does it percolate up? So he talked about both bottom up and top down and where they meet and how that might happen in the brain and how we get causality, how we, we actually make decisions and do, do stuff, do things uh, in, a, in a pure physics sense without worrying too much, in his case, about the actual biology. So I thought that was a very good, uh, very good talk. The final talk in that session was uh, our first keynotes uh, of the day of, this, of the conference. Roger Penrose, Sir Roger, of course, my uh, collaborator and someone who's been to numerous uh, TSC conferences, including the first one in 1994. And Roger um, spoke about uh, in two topics, really. The first one was understanding. And uh, it goes back to his book in 1989, The Emperor's New Mind, where he took issue with uh, AI, artificial intelligence. The Emperor's New Mind being kind of a metaphor for you know, the naked emperor who uh, everybody was embarrassed or too scared to say he doesn't have any clothes except this brave little boy. And Roger's idea back then was that AI was really winging it and the, I mean, pushing the idea that the brain is a computer without any evidence whatsoever. And I always thought at the time that the emperor in that case was Marvin Minsky, the scion of, of artificial intelligence. Anyway, he tried to boil it down to something very understandable, namely understanding. He said a computer might beat a person in chess, but the computer doesn't understand chess whatsoever. And he gave some examples of, of chess uh, uh, moves and uh, settings of the, play, of, the, of the pieces. I'm not a, a chess player very much, so I didn't really totally understand it, but he gave some examples where the, a machine would lose, where, whereas a human would automatically see that there was some, some other way out. It's because the human understands the game and the, uh, the uh, machine didn't. It's kind of like John Searle's old idea of the, uh, the Chinese room, where you can have a, somebody in a room who's fed uh, Chinese figures in a lookup table and matches them and winds up uh, translating without understanding Chinese whatsoever. And Roger was giving a, a good example of that in terms of, of chess and also the game of Go, uh, which is another AI uh, approach now. So, um, but then at the last few minutes, he turned to something completely different, something, a new idea. He told me he wanted something new and different for this conference, and he delivered. Um, there's been a lot of work in neuroscience over the years suggesting some kind of backward referral. This goes back to uh, Ben Libet's ideas and a lot of things in parapsychology, precognition, Daryl Bem's uh, work, uh, Beerman Radin. Uh, many people have, uh, have suggested, and there's pretty good evidence for the fact that we seem to know what's going to happen slightly before it happens, maybe you know, up to a second, a half a second, several hundred milliseconds. And Libet showed this clearly back in 1979, although his, his, um, his results were kind of uh, 
um, mixed up and confused and, and kind of uh, co-opted for other purposes. But I think uh, the, the evidence uh, does exist. And Roger explained this at, from the level of physics, how this could happen, taking it down to the level of space-time curvature, because he thinks a particle location is equivalent to a particular curvature in space-time geometry. And if you have a superposition uh, of two things, one will, one, will, uh, 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 one will continue and the other one will cease to exist, and this one is chosen in collapse of the wave function. What he suggested was that the one that disappears, that um, um, consciousness goes back to when it first split off so that it never existed. Otherwise, you have this information that gets lost. And, Information can't be lost, except it may be in black holes. So it was a very uh, erudite and profound, uh, again, idea that I think we're going to hear more of. It was really exciting, and people got it, and people were really thrilled by it. Yes, that was quite a big moment, wasn't it? It was. And uh, it's it just great to see Roger back again um, after many years here. And uh, obviously, it means a lot to you because he's your collaborator, and uh, for him to come here with this uh, great new idea. Big, yeah. exciting moment for the conference. He's getting younger at age 86. I should also add that on Thursday, uh, he, uh, we snuck him, I didn't, but we snuck him over to the University of Arizona where he, he gave the Thursday afternoon physics and astronomy colloquium about his theory of uh, cyclical conformal cosmology, where he says the Big Bang was preceded by another eon, which had its own Big Bang, which was preceded by yet another eon going all the way down. And I've tried to, a I've asked him whether he thinks consciousness existed in previous eons and might even be changing and evolving with each transition. He didn't quite go for that, but he's thinking about it. But what he talked about, what his new thing about this now has to do with dark matter and the fact that when the, these new big bangs occurred, that there's dark matter created, but eventually it decays over the course of the eon. And in fact, it's the decay of the dark matter that uh, results in the the end of that eon. And more, uh, he also characterized dark matter as being of the Planck mass, which is about 10 to the minus fifth gr uh, grams, which is actually pretty large. Um, and uh, uh, he has given a name to these proposed particles called Erebons. And Erebon is a, uh, I think, uh, Greek, or I can't remember which, maybe uh, Egyptian mythology uh, of the uh, Lord of the Darkness, because they're dark matter. So, uh, air bonds, you heard it first from Roger Penrose. Wonderful. From physics to philosophy. Yes. Uh, Friday afternoon was the, uh, well, first of all, the second session was Dave Chalmers, uh, who, of course, uh, uh, made the hard problem famous back at the 1994 conference. And uh, uh, Dave has been a big part of the conference ever since. Uh, he gave the keynote on what he called the meta problem of consciousness which uh, basically said, well, besides the hard problem, you know, what do we think of a theory of consciousness? And he kind of took a big step back. And I would say a big step backwards. I think, I, I, I think Dave, not to say that he's given up on the hard problem, he's actually a dualist, so he doesn't really have, uh, consider the hard problem, but the meta problem uh, seemed to me uh, more of a, incorporating the easy problems in with the hard problem. And so uh, it was interesting, and Dave's a great presenter, but um, uh, let's just leave it at that. Okay, moving on to um, after Dave. Yes, the afternoon session was idealism, panpsychism, and panprotopsychism, and that involved uh, Deepak Chopra, uh, Hedda Hassel Morch, and then myself. Deepak talked about idealism coming from the uh, Eastern uh, uh, spiritual Vedanta tradition, where everything is consciousness. We are all manifestation of one enormous universal consciousness. And uh, that's idealism. It's hard to disprove. It's impossible to prove. Uh, but that's his approach. And uh, he gave a pretty compelling argument for it. Um, and that's his, that's his view. It borders on religious. It, it is religion, actually. And, uh, and yet it's, it's a valid view, I've always thought. I don't agree with it. And in the discussion afterwards, I, somebody asked me, I said, well, I believe in reality. I think there is a reality out there because, and he was questioned about solipsism, the idea that if, you know, if you project your consciousness, does it match what I project and how does it all work out in the end? So um, it, was a, uh, it was a good presentation and uh, of a view that's hard to, that's hard to refute, but, but also hard to, to prove. The second uh, speaker was Hedda Hassel-Morch, a uh, Norwegian uh, philosopher 
who is now at NYU. She's, uh, I think, a uh, postdoc with, uh, with Dave and others at NYU. And she took a panpsychist view, the idea that uh, all particles have consciousness uh, down at the atomic or maybe even sub subatomic uh, level. And a lot of uh, neuroscientists and philosophers have come around to that view, including Christoph Koch and Giulio Tononi. Uh, of IIT, Integrated Information Theory fame, and uh, uh, Hedda uh, kind of defended panpsychism. But the problem with panpsychism, as she admitted, is that if you've got consciousness at micro levels here, there, and everywhere, how does it combine into the, uh, the full rich conscious experience that we, are, we all uh, appreciate and have? And <clears throat> it's called the, the combination problem in uh, panpsychism. And to solve it, she attempted to invoke uh, Tononi's integrated information theory, which basically says it's a measure of complexity uh, of a value called phi that can be determined by the information content uh, based on um, subnetworks within networks and that sort of thing. And uh, but it can be applied to anything so that a, um, a thermostat, if properly configured, would be conscious. Um, <clears throat> but um, it didn't convince me, but I'm, again, I'm biased. But the bottom line was she attempted to use uh, Tononi complexity and phi to solve the combination problem. As, as I asked her in the discussion, if, uh, if that occurred, if the complexity or phi at the level of microtubules was higher than the level of neurons, then would consciousness derive from microtubules or neurons? And if that were the case, would that be a victory for IIT or for ORC OR, our theory? And she said both, which is a good answer. So the point is that that kind of complexity could be happening at a deeper level in the microtubules. And let's see, the third speaker was, uh, oh, oh, it was me, that's right. So um, I spoke about what I call quantum panproto-psychism. And rather than panpsychism, where every particle uh, has a little bing, a little conscious experience, I said that every collapse of the wave function had a moment of conscious experience. And this is borrowed directly from Roger Penrose's original idea, where space-time curvature develops and then collapse occurs, and when that happens is a moment of conscious experience. It turns around the, the observer effect. Rather than what Dave Chalmers or, or um, uh, von Neumann or Bohr or Wigner or Stapp would say, where consciousness causes collapse of the wave function. You know about Schrodinger's cat, dead and alive. It's both dead and alive until somebody looks. That's consciousness causing collapse. The problem with that is it puts consciousness outside science. We don't know what it is. So it's a dualist position. And Dave's a dualist, and he's entitled to that position. Roger turned that around and said collapse causes consciousness, or collapse is consciousness, if you claim an identity theory. And... Um, and that's the basic idea. But then that faces the same combination problem that panpsychism does. How do you get these little micro proto consciousness that are events that are happening everywhere in the environment, here, there, and everywhere, into unified conscious experience? And uh, with quantum mechanics, you have a big advantage because we can have quantum coherence, co condensation, entanglement that can bring disparate processes. Uh, into one unified conscious experience, both spatially and temporally. So processes happening in various parts of the brain, collapses happening in various parts of the brain, even in slightly different times in the brain, can be unified into one conscious ex experience. So if you see uh, uh, something in the sky uh, that's moving, uh, shape, color, motion, meaning are processed in different places in the brain and at different times, but that's okay, it can be all be bound together into one frame with funny backward time effects so that we see one thing and we know all of a sudden it's an airplane or it's a kite and with the associated sound or lack of sound. So uh, that, was, uh, that was my effort uh, based on my work with Roger and we had a great discussion at the end uh, with the three of us and, and Dave uh, chaired it. So that was a good session too. Excellent. So a question on panpsychism because it seems as if, if people like Tononi and uh, Koch are moving in that direction, it's kind of a big shift one thing from their traditional, more materialist classic. Is panpsychism seen as a classical approach? I think they see it as a classical approach. Uh, maybe uh, Chalmers is trying to take a quantum panpsychism approach, but from the dualism perspective, which doesn't make any sense. And uh, when I asked him, well, where does the consciousness comes in? He, uh, at one point, he and, and or his uh, collaborator, Kelvin McQueen, had said, well, maybe it comes from another universe. And I took objection to that because in the anthropic principle, uh, the idea is that our universe, if you believe in multiple worlds, which I don't, 
but in the multiple worlds idea and the anthropic principle, our universe is the only one that has consciousness um, because uh, it's, well, there are these physical constants which have to be exactly what they are to have consciousness. And uh, um, ours seems to be the only one. So uh, if you bring in consciousness from another universe, it would be an inferior brand of consciousness. So once I asked them that, they, I, they haven't brought it up since. Yeah, yeah. The panpsychist thing is fascinating because it's still saying, well, particles have this property. Yeah. Or, uh, uh, and so it's still a problem, isn't it? How do they have this property of consciousness? Well, it's just a given. It's fundamental and irreducible. And at some point, you know, things in the universe just exist. How does mass exist? Spin, charge, everything. You know, at some point, uh, things come along with the, in the woodwork and in the hardware of the universe, and uh, uh, it could be the consciousnesses among them. Okay, great. And that's it for this fourth program in our 2018 series. I hope you've enjoyed today's offerings. Don't forget, there's still one more show in the series in which, in which I actually get to talk with the globally famous Sophia the Robot and her creator, David Hansen of Hansen Robotics. So be sure to check that out. Until then, this is Nick Day saying thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Bye now.